Blessed be our God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who lives now and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich. Of all he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain, When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out of himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made an intercession for the transgressors. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Crucify him, crucify him, I said to them. 
Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, <coughs> especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. <coughs> but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water he who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of the scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. We're on the edge. We're on the edge of the pandemic finally ending. More and more people are getting vaccinated. And with the security of the vaccine, a sense of safety that it's okay to get out and do stuff. Businesses are opening up. Traffic is returning. There was a terrible backup on 101 just today. Oh, the good old days. The schools are opening up. We're so close. Could this be the end? Are we on the edge? of going back to normal? Could that be in sight? But after this year-long night, can we go back to normal? What is normal? We're standing on the edge of this pandemic ending. Being on the edge can be full of anxiety. It's not quite solid ground because the future isn't for sure. You really don't want to go back, but you can't trust what's ahead. When, how can you trust what's ahead when you've never experienced it? It's an unknown. After everything we've been through, can we trust what's next? I remember being on edge as I watched my son and husband stand on the edge of a cliff overlooking the deep blue beautiful waters of Crater Lake, perched with their toes literally hanging over this like must have been 40 foot high cliff, getting poised to jump off the edge. The people who had taken that 40-foot leap into the icy cold lake down below were calling out words of encouragement. Jump, jump, you can do it. Just step off. 
It's great. It's beautiful down here. You can do it. Really, it's great. They were shouting these supportive words to their friends and to the stranger standing high above the edge. It became an impromptu support group because some of those strangers would be standing right there on the edge for a long, long time, breathing, shaking their hands and arms to loosen up, closing their eyes, opening their eyes, trying to muster the courage to go off the edge and leap in. Some seemed determined to step out, and then they lost heart and walked back. No, no, no. They went onto the edge again. The decision wasn't coming quickly. But they couldn't quit standing on the edge, not able to jump and not wanting to walk back either. They were afraid even though they wanted to, even when everyone around them was taking the leap, even when they had so many voices of encouragement. So they just stood there, immobilized. Some finally did move and walk away, deciding they didn't have the stamina, just too tired, saying, no, no, no. I'm not up for it. Sometimes we stand on the edge for a long time, frozen, not wanting to go back because that might seem like failure, and equally afraid of what will happen if we just step forward and jump. So we just stand stuck on that anxious edge. Possibly hoping something will shift in us, uh, will unlock inside, and that new self will just move off and leap in. Or maybe we're hoping we won't have to make the decision at all, that fantasizing that someone else will just push us off, or pull us away. We're attracted to leaping into the beautiful water below and terrified to do it at the exact same time. Peter and Pilate, in those pre-dawn hours, found themselves taken to the edge by this person, Jesus. Peter had been following Jesus after his arrest all night long, sticking close. And now he was just outside the court, loyal, not wanting to abandon his friend, and terrified for himself at the same time. Peter had come to the edge of his loyalty to his friend, when he was directly asked by a stranger, are you his friend? Didn't I see you? He couldn't do it. He walked back. He lied. No. No. I'm not him. He could only go so far with his support. He had thought that he'd already jumped and that he was swimming in the waters with Jesus. Then, the edge of day, he saw that he hadn't even jumped in. He was still on the edge after all. Pilot. Pilate saw something in Jesus that affected him deep inside. Pilate knew a political game was going on. He was a politician, after all. He was also a Roman. He knew his Greek philosophy. 
Pilate was intrigued, attracted by something he saw in Jesus. Perhaps the integrity, the authenticity. He experienced Jesus, something fascinating. Something clicked in him. And during the inquiry, Pilate found himself on the edge, almost converted. He doesn't want to put this man to death. He sees no threat. He seeks alternatives. Where's your kingdom? He tries to throw him back to Ananias and Caiaphas. He offers to use the tradition of setting a prisoner free at the Passover. In these pre-dawn hours, when the stars fade, but the sun isn't up yet, when it's the edge of a new day, Pilate himself stood on the edge. He knew the truth. He knew what was happening. But in the end, fear for his own political life took hold and he handed Jesus over. He walked back away from the edge. We are on the edge, attracted to the future, and yet frightened at the same time. We are in those pre-dawn hours. The night of this pandemic has brought us to the edge so many times. We've seen our streets go empty and silent. We have lived in daily fear of contracting this virus or infecting someone. Being stuck inside with no way to distract ourselves, we've seen people murdered for the color of their skin, and this time we couldn't turn away. We've seen the mind-numbing numbers of people who've died of COVID, experienced friends, loved ones die alone. We see before us the lack of health care for the poor, we know the people who have lost their jobs. We have gone without hugging our relatives for over a year. Our children wear masks and are, have learned to avoid people. And we've seen children in cages. We've learned our lives are too cluttered. We are overscheduled. We realized our time together has been wasted. After all this, what does normal mean anymore? Peter and Pilate stood at a cruxus, attracted and frightened at the same time. Knowing the truth in Jesus, glimpsing this new thing that transformed the law, that brought healing and enlightenment that was merciful. Peter and Pilate, in the end, made a choice. They were just too tired and too afraid. They just couldn't jump. So, they chose to walk back on the path of self-interest. We stand on the edge in these pre-dawn hours, and we may have caught a glimpse of something better than normal. We're attracted to those beautiful blue waters of a new life. We're drawn to doing things differently, to not return, not walk back. After this night, on this edge of this new day, 
Will we take the plunge?
Dear people of God, Jesus came into the world not to condemn it, but that the world through him might be delivered from the power of sin and death. That all who believe in him might become heirs of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church throughout the world. We pray for those who gather this day and for those who are separated by this pandemic. We pray for the church's unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, for the people of God, for our bishop, Mark, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his people in faith, increase them in love, and preserve them in peace. In this time of pandemic, let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Joseph, the President of the United States. For Alex, Diane, and Jackie, members of Congress and the members of the Supreme Court. For the members and representatives of the United Nations. For city council members and county supervisors. For all who serve the common good. That by God's help, they may seek justice, compassion, and truth and live in peace and conquered. Hear us, O God. God, graciously hear us. Let us pray for all who suffer or are afflicted in body, mind, or spirit. For the hungry and the homeless, the destitute, and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and in anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God, in God's mercy, will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of God's love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Hear us, O God. God, graciously hear us. Let us pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God, for Palestinian Christians and Muslims, and all who share the sacred city. Hear us, O God. God graciously hear us. Let us pray for all who have no faith, living lives without any sense of holiness or divine presence, for those who have never heard words of hope or salvation, for those who have lost their faith or whose faith has lost depth and become routine, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the faithful, for those who, in the name of God, have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to truth and love and lead them to faith and obedience. Hear us, O God. God graciously hear us. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world, and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, 
we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably upon your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working out of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which had been cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, our, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in our vocation and ministry we may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.